We have so far seen that the Comet was the first real jetliner and that the Boeing 707 was the jet who really defined the shape of several generations of jetliners that came after it. But before all of that, there was a humble piston engine aircraft that managed to persevere for decades even after the arrival of the jet age. And for at least one generation, this was the aircraft that gave people their first taste of flying, either in peace or during wartime. There are several of these almost magical aircraft still flying around today, and if they stick around for another decade or so, it would mean that this type have been flying for 100 years. We are of course talking about the story of the iconic and wonderful Douglas DC-3 and how this beloved aircraft almost didn't even leave the drawing board. Stay tuned. Before we get going properly, I have a little quiz for you. Here's a picture of the cockpit of a DC-3 and up here over the windshield we can see the magneto switches for the two engines. You know, the switches that will allow the engines to actually start when they're turned around. But all of the other engine controls are located in a different part of the cockpit between the two pilots where you might expect to fly them. So why would Douglas place the magneto switches up there? Have a think about it and we'll get back to it later on. The DC-3 is an all-metal aircraft, but to understand how it got off the drawing board and into service, we have to start by talking a little bit about wood. On the 31st of March 1931, a Fokker F-10 tri-motor airliner crashed in Kansas, killing all eight passengers and crew on board. The operator of the aircraft was Transcontinental and Western Air, maybe better known as TWA. This was a high-profile crash, because one of the passengers was Knute Rockne, a famous college football coach. An investigation showed that the crash was likely caused by the structural failure of one of the wing spars. A wing spar is basically a beam stretching spanwise from the fuselage to the wingtip, holding together the rest of the wing structure and connecting it to the fuselage. As you probably guessed, in the Fokker F-10, the main wing spars were made of wood, in this case of a kind of wood laminate. The most likely cause of the failure was that excess moisture had seeped into the wing, gradually loosening the bond between the layers of wood, eventually causing the failure. Now, the use of wood for aircraft structures was quite common at the time and would remain in use for some small general aviation and experimental aircraft to this day. It's actually a great, resilient and flexible material. But after that 1931 crash, the FAA introduced new rules severely restricting wood as a structural material for commercial passenger planes. And because of the high-profile nature of the TWA crash, the matter got plenty of public negative attention, which meant that the airlines now suddenly wanted to replace their older planes fast. This resulted in an aircraft design and manufacturing rush, and immediately TWA had a serious problem. They couldn't find someone to make the planes that they needed. The first company that TWA turned to was, of course, Boeing, who, even before that infamous crash, had a flying prototype of a very promising new aircraft called the Boeing 247. This was an all-metal airliner with seats for 10 passengers. Now, that passenger capacity was a bit below that of the Fokker F-10, but apart from that, the aircraft would fit TWA's needs for a new airliner perfectly. But there was one small problem with the Boeing 247. Basically, Boeing wasn't just Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer at the time. Boeing's own history is a very long story by itself, but the point here is that by 1931, when the TWA accident happened, Boeing was part of a company group called the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation. And this group also included what we now know as United Airlines. So when TWA came knocking on Boeing's door looking to buy its 247 all-metal airliner, Boeing responded that its production of the type would prioritize, well, United, of course. If TWA wanted the 247, they would have to wait until Boeing first finished making 60 of these aircraft for United. But instead of waiting, TWA decided to invite offers from multiple other manufacturers for an aircraft variant that would meet its design needs. 
This, an airline asking manufacturers for its own aircraft design, actually wasn't unheard of in the 1920s and 30s. Obviously, this aircraft would need to have an all-metal structure, but TWA also wanted it to be able to carry at least 12 passengers and have three engines like the Fokker F-10 did. They also had some other requirements involving, for example, the speed and range it would need to be able to perform. TWA wanted three engines because they wanted to reverse the public's negative safety perception after the accident I mentioned before, and to achieve that they wanted an aircraft that would be able to take off and land even after an engine failure, and they didn't think that this would be possible with a twin-engine aircraft of this size. Now, Donald Douglas from the Douglas Aircraft Company saw the tender that TWA put out and became interested. But up until that point, they had been focusing mainly on making planes for the US military. This meant that they had no real experience in making passenger airliners at all. Douglas, however, believed that he could build an aircraft with two engines that would meet TWA's size and performance specifications, but initially he had some doubts whether or not it actually existed a market big enough for the company to be able to make a profit after their development costs. As it would later turn out, Douglas would not need to worry about that, although in a weird way, the incredible success of his aircraft would later become a huge problem, not only for his competitors, but also for his own company. And I'll tell you why after this. Do you like the story so far? Well, if you do, then let me introduce you to today's sponsor and one of the sources my crew and I use to research it. Ground News is an absolutely fantastic platform if you want to stay up to date with what's happening in the aviation industry and compare how different news sites report on it. Here, I'll give you a great recent example. A while back, a sonic boom was reported over the Washington area and I immediately went to Ground News to get an overview of what was going on. As you can see here, they don't just give you the gist of the story, but they also provide a comprehensive list of which news outlets are currently reporting on it and what they're all saying. But what really sets Ground News apart from other sites is that they showcase the political leaning and biased distribution of each article, ensuring that you are aware of potential blind spots in your own little bubble that we all find ourselves in. I have personally been using Ground News for a few years now and I can't recommend them enough. Now, if this sounds interesting to you, which it really should, then use the link here below, which is ground.news slash mentor now. You can sign up for absolutely free, but if you find it as useful as I do, then you can use my link to get a 30% discount on the unlimited version and you will also be supporting me. Thank you Ground News, now back to the story. The first aircraft that Don Douglas made for TWA was called the DC-1. By the way, the letters DC mean Douglas Commercial, and obviously the DC-1 was the company's first aircraft in that category. Its similarity with the later DC-3 is immediately obvious if you look at it, and more importantly, TWA absolutely loved it. TWA eventually put this first aircraft into service, only with a few modifications, but they requested a few more changes to the definitive production version. That version was aptly named the DC-2, which had the same wing as the DC-1, but a slightly longer fuselage to better accommodate 14 instead of 12 seats, and it also had a more powerful version of the Wright Cyclone R1820 radial engine. Now, Don Douglas wanted to build at least 100 of these planes to make the project profitable, and TWA initially bought only 20 DC-2s, plus the initial DC-1. But Douglas finally ended up making nearly 200 DC-2s for various customers from the year 1934 until 39, making the project a relatively big success. Now, even before the production ended, Douglas had been working on a couple of newer designs based on the DC-2. One of them was the B-18 Bolo, which was a military bomber with a slightly bigger wing and a different fuselage, but otherwise using much of the same systems as the DC-2. This bomber is almost forgotten today, but Douglas actually made 350 of them starting in 1936, and in that same year, before finishing production of the DC-2, Douglas introduced the DC-3. And it would soon become obvious that its timing couldn't have been better. Now, you might assume that DC-3 is just an updated, enlarged version of the DC-2, and this would be, well, mostly true, but there is a bit more to it than that. You see, initially, the aircraft that we all refer to as the DC-3 was not actually called this 
at all. It was known as the DST, which stood for the Douglas Sleeper Transport. The original DC-2's cabin had been 1.7 meters or 66 inches wide, which was good enough for an aisle with one seat on either side of it. This is what we normally refer to as a one-to-one -one layout. Now the DC-3, or the DST, had a 2.3 meter wide cabin, which would fit two-to-one or even a two-to-two -two seat layout, which also later became standard. But to begin with, the reason why the new aircraft was this wide was because someone specifically American Airlines CEO Cyrus Roland Smith, wanted to install sleeping berth in the aircraft. Shh. And the idea was to place these berths above the seats instead of overhead luggage racks, because overhead bins weren't really a thing back then. If you look at the picture of an original Douglas DST, you will notice that above every second passenger window, there's actually a smaller window, and this was for the passenger who was lying in the berth. Now, I'm not sure how useful a window was when people wanted to sleep, but if they wanted one, there it was. American Airlines bought 20 DSTs configured aircraft, and a few other airlines also got them. These planes had basically the same seat capacity as the older DC-2s, 14 or sometimes 16 seat, but this didn't last very long. Turns out that most customers would instead order their aircraft in the form of a DC-3, with no upper berth windows and anywhere from 21 to 30 seats instead, making it much more profitable. Before Douglas switched its production to military orders back in 1942, they made just over 600 DC-3s and DC-3 Alphas, where the three Alphas had more powerful Pratt & Whitney R1830 twin WASP engines. And if the aircraft's production had ended there, at 600 aircraft, it would probably have been seen as a considerably big success by all measures. But that's not what happened. Douglas would instead end up making well over 10,000 military C-47 Skytrains, or Dakotas as they were known by the British. Military versions had other designations, including C-48, C-53 and more, depending on whether they were meant for troops, VIPs or cargo. 600 commercial and 10,000 military aircraft is an amazing production run. And remember, there are also those 350 older bombers that were based on the DC-2. But these are just the numbers of aircraft that were made directly by Douglas. There were also factories in a couple of other places who were making versions of the DC-3 under license. The most prolific of these was Lisunov in the Soviet Union, who made over 6,000 Li-2 units. The last of these left the factory in 1952, making them the newest DC-3 factory variant of all, but of course that's not including the DC-3 modifications, but we will get to those later. Instead, perhaps the most surprising producer of a variant of the DC-3 on the license was Japan. Nearly 500 aircraft were made in total between two manufacturers, Showa and Nakajima. The first of these were basically very close to the originals with American-built Pratt & Whitney radial engines, but later the Japanese companies would modify the aircraft in order to ease production and also switch to Japanese engines. Now, Listing the different roles of the C-47 and other military variants of the DC-3 would basically make a one hour long video by itself. The planes were basically used for everything, from carrying troops and cargo to photo recognizance, dropping parachutists and even dropping bombs in some places. And interestingly, the end of the Second World War did not spell the end of the military usage for the C-47s and other variants of the DC-3. The aircraft also played a key role in the Berlin airlift in 1948 and 49, and was even used as a gunship during the Vietnam War. The C-47 maybe wasn't the biggest or the best all-around transport aircraft. Plenty of other bigger planes emerged during the war, like the C-54 Skymaster, which was a military Douglas DC-4 for example, but the smaller twin-engine C-47 was ubiquitous and could get in and out of tighter fields, making it completely indispensable during the Second World War. However, the type then became equally indispensable in many parts of the world long after the war had ended in the design it was originally thought to be used in, commercial aircraft. And that was because thousands of the military aircraft that had survived the war later converted to DC-3 passenger aircraft. Now, a funny side note here is that some of the earlier military planes had originally been built as DC-3s and then been converted to military use, 
before finally being reconverted back to commercial use again. Other World War II aircraft were also converted to commercial or other civilian roles after the war, but nothing at the same scale as the C-47. A sea of converted DC-3s became a boon for small airline startups after the war, both in the United States and in other parts of the world. It's worth pointing out here that before the war, flying by air was really quite rare, something that very few people could afford to do. But the war didn't just generate all of these airplanes. It also led to the creation of hundreds of new airports, creating opportunities for more passengers, new airlines and many former military pilots to fly. But this also created a very strange problem, particularly for aircraft manufacturers. You see, with the jet age just around the corner and loads of new technologies emerging, the manufacturers had started approaching the airlines with new ideas for better, faster and more capable airliners in order to replace the DC-3. But for the most part, nobody really listened to them. By the end of the war, the DC-3 was obviously very slow and not particularly comfortable or modern. It didn't have a pressurized cabin, so it had to fly through or preferably around bad weather. But buying a brand new aircraft was much more expensive, often many times more expensive than buying a whole fleet of older, slower, but still dependable DC-3s. For manufacturers, the only way to sell anything new became instead to make it much bigger, preferably with a longer range, putting it in a completely different market than the DC-3. Interestingly, in the United States, the FAA soon started to become quite worried about the ways that some ex-military aircraft of multiple types were being used commercially after the war. The agency actually started tightening its rules in order to try and prevent the widespread use of these planes and that gave Douglas an idea. The company would offer what it called the Super DC-3 or the DC-3S, which in practice was an extensively modified version of its original aircraft. The outer wing sections would be replaced with longer ones that had flush rivets and a swept trailing edge, plus the fuselage would be extended and the aircraft fitted with more powerful engines. These engines also necessitated a bigger and more square vertical stabilizer, which is the most recognizable feature of the Super DC-3. These and other modifications helped increase the cruise speed of the aircraft from around 180 to 220 knots, which was a significant but not a huge difference. Douglas offered this as an upgrade to the airlines, especially those who already had DC-3s in their fleets, and the idea was that this upgrade would also satisfy the newer FAA safety regulations, which Douglas thought would be a great selling point. So how many Super DC-3 modifications did Douglas sell? The answer is none, at least not to the airlines. Because as it turned out, modifying the standard old DC-3s to meet the FAA's newer and more stringent safety regulations was actually possible and much, much cheaper than buying or upgrading to a Super DC-3. It's quite ironic that given that the FAA's rules for commercial aircraft motivated the creation of the Super DC-3, the only buyer of this airplane ended up being the US Navy. About 100 of these planes, designated the R3D8s and the later C-117Ds, would enter service with the US Navy and the Marines. And the last one of them didn't leave service until in the 1990s, with some examples still flying today in the hands of commercial operators. There were many, many more modifications to the DC-3s for specialized roles in the years that followed. A lot of different companies modified them with turboprop engines, including Bastler, who is still rebuilding and modifying these aircraft today. Many people have fond memories of these old birds today, and I completely understand why. They're beautiful. A couple of years ago, I actually made a video where I was exploring the outside and the interior of a DC-3 that was once operated by Scandinavian air systems. Just like we do, you'll be amazed how similar this aircraft actually is to modern airliners. It tells a little bit about how slowly things moves in the aviation industry. It was incredible to see how similar the equipment and the placement of gauges, switches and controls are to commercial aircraft used today. But of course, if you think about it, the 737 that I fly was heavily based on the 707, whose prototype first flew in the mid-1950s. That's only 20 years or so after the DC-3's first flight, so there is a good reason why many of our cockpits today have so much in common with this lovely old bird. 
And this finally brings us back to those magneto switches above the windshield. Have you figured out why they are there yet? Well, for the explanation of this, we have to give a shout out to Mikey McBrien and his father, Buffalo Joe of Buffalo Airways. The magneto switches are there so that they are visible from the outside of the aircraft when the pilots do their walk around before departure. Among many other things, the DC-3's walk-around involves checking that the propellers can move freely. But before you even put a hand on the propeller, you need to check that the magneto switches are switched off, so that the engine doesn't start when you turn it. The only way to see that from the position you are standing is if the switches are on the overhead panel. And part of me is actually wondering if the fact that the start switches on the 737 are also placed there is a distant shout-out to this old bird. I find it amazing to think that some of these planes are still in active commercial service today. Often the reason for this are economic. The planes are so overbuilt that they're still going happily, of course, provided that they're properly maintained, and they're still cheaper to purchase and operate than many alternatives. But likely the biggest reason that they're still around is because they can still fulfill a role that very few other aircraft can. The DC-3's ability to operate in small, rough fields still sometimes makes it the most suitable vehicle for icy, muddy and other inhospitable environments well into the 21st century. Now, I hope that you liked this little odyssey into the fog of history and if you did, make sure that you have liked the video and subscribed to the channel. I am producing these classic t-shirts on my spring store and there will be more and more models coming available very soon, so go in and check it out by the links below. Now check out this video next and remember that you can support my work by buying a t-shirt, supporting my sponsor or becoming a member of my fantastic Patreon crew. There are links to all of this here, somewhere on the screen or in the description below. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.